Good evening from Brisbane, everybody, and welcome to this webinar on the UK-Australia Free Trade Agreement and how it benefits uh, tech in business. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land across Australia, um, and I'd like to pay my uh, respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and to any First Nations people who may be joining us uh, here this evening. It's an absolute pleasure for the Department for Business and Trade uh, for the UK Government uh, Network in Australia to be partnering with our Australian colleagues at Austrade today. And this session is aimed at supporting tech businesses in both Australia and the UK to understand and utilize the free trade agreement to help you conduct cross-border trade and investment activities between our two amazing countries. First of all, a little bit of housekeeping. We are recording today's session and it will be made available on uh, the Austrade and DPT websites after this event. Uh, please put any questions that you have uh, this evening uh, in the chat throughout the webinar, and we'll make sure that we um, answer them and ask them during our panel discussion later in the session. So to start with some introductions, um, I'm Richard Cowan. I'm the Consul General for Queensland and the Northern Territories uh, for the British government here in Australia. I'm also the country director for the Department for Business and Trade. A very, very warm welcome to my counterpart in London, Anna Nishinadza, um, Australia's Trade and Investment Commissioner for the UK and Ireland, uh, based there in London, uh, to Kirsty Whitford, our Senior Trade and Development Manager here at uh, DBT in Australia, um, to Kate Montgomery, the Director of Marketing for Telstra in the UK, to George Riddle, Director of Trade Strategy at EY in the UK. And uh, many of you will probably know that this is the uh, last of our two webinars for tech businesses um, about the FTA. Last week, we explored the FTA provisions and market environment for fintech, whilst today's session is going to focus on the broader technology industry and the innovation provisions of the FTA. So a little bit about our program and what we're going to do. We are going to have a brief overview of two-way trade and investment and an introduction to the FTA. Uh, then we're going to look at macro trends and opportunities in tech in Australia and the UK. And this is really, really important because uh, of the business opportunities uh, are the reason that I think you're here today and one of the things that makes the FTA really exciting. Then we're going to move into a panel discussion which will be moderated by uh, Kirsty Whitford and it will focus on how businesses can utilize the FTA to their advantage. And we're very grateful to have Kate and George join us for that channel. And uh, following the panel discussion, we'll have time for a bit of Q&A. So as I said, please do uh, pop those questions into the chat and we'll do our best to cover them towards the end of the webinar. So uh, moving on to our next, uh, next slide, please. So a very quick um, overview of trade and investment between uh, the UK and Australia. Um, so that, that trade and investment from the UK to Australia, so um, the UK exported about 10 billion pounds of goods and services to Australia in 2022, and it imported about 4.4 billion from Australia over that same period. So our trade together is worth about 15 billion pounds. That's about 30 million Aussie dollars. So I think that's pretty significant uh, for both of our countries. Um, we are also very big um, investment partners. Um, so foreign direct investment from Australia to the UK uh, totals uh, $16.1 billion, um, making it the second largest destination uh, behind the USA. That was, obviously that was in 2021. Um, and the UK is also the second largest um, source of investment uh, in Australia. Um, and in 2019, that was worth some 686 uh, billion Aussie dollars. Um, just as a, a matter of interest, there's things that we kind of import uh, and export to each other. So from the UK to Australia, there's lots of medicines, lots of pharma, lots of cars, lots of services, uh, and also quite a lot of alcohol too. And then in the other direction, there is also a lot of, um, a lot of services, um, a lot of iron ore, a lot of metals, but also uh, a lot of alcohol too. So I think we've got some, some very thirsty people on, on both sides of that UK-Australia relationship. 
But anyway, moving on uh, to our to our next slide, and just to give us a very quick overview of the FTAs. So they both, um, oh, well, sorry, the FTA entered into force uh, on the 31st of May. It is a gold standard FTA. It eliminates uh, pretty much all of our tariffs on goods, but it's also really, really important in the services sector as well. Um, I say that because when I go out and talk to businesses, they tell me that they want certainty on their supply chains, certainty on their data flows, and certainty and confidence in their ESG arrangements. And this agreement does all of that. It goes further than any uh, other trade deal that the UK or Australia has with anybody else. It locks us into dialogue mechanisms for certainty and it binds us together in areas of shared challenge. So that includes things like environmental conservation, uh, gender equality, animal welfare, and there are also some very special provisions around uh, First Nations. Um, and right now we're still within that first 100 days of entering into force. So together, um, Austrade and DBT are working uh, to support our businesses and help them utilize uh, the things that are available out there. So these webinars are just the beginning um, of it. So if we could move on to our next slide, please, and just look at uh, um, or just consider quickly some of the highlights um, around the FTA for uh, the tech sector. So um, what I hear more than anything is that uh, tech is reliant on human capital um, and it's the human capital and that confidence in the relationship between the UK and Australia um, that really drives uh, opportunities um, in this sector. But some of the other uh, highlights that are there. So it's improved um, digital trade, particularly the free flow of data, meaning that there are less restrictions on the collection, processing and transferring of uh, data between our two countries. Um, there's also a very important bit around access to public sector contracts, uh, including for the digitally, digitally uh, delivered services. Um, and just as I mentioned before, that focus on human capital, what this FTA does um, around mobility is actually very special. It increases the mobility and mutual recognition of qualifications between our two countries. I think one of the most uh, apparent and most uh, kind of immediately visible things is that our working holiday and youth mobility schemes, uh, the age limit uh, for that has increased from uh, the age of 18 to 30 to the age of 18 to 35. Um, and it's also uh, allowed us to um, increase the amount of time that people people can spend on those schemes uh, up to three years in both countries. Obviously, that comes in um, over a period of time. Uh, but there are also some very new uh, visa provisions that will enable, um, facilitate, make intercourt transfers even easier um, and a new pathway for Australian innovators to come to the UK. But um, what I'd like to also just highlight here in this tech space is that the FTA has an innovation chapter. It's the world's first dedicated uh, innovation chapter in any FTA, and it uh, puts together a strategic innovation dialogue um, for uh, the UK and Australia, which will uh, help us drive the commercialization of new technology, help us ensure that our regulatory environment remains uh, aligned, giving you that confidence uh, into the future. And it will help, um, you know, th through that, it will help with technological developments. Um, the dialogue will also include uh, consultation with uh, business experts and stakeholders to inform all of these discussions. So we really do encourage you to talk to us, you know, to talk to DBT, to talk to Austrade about any uh, issues that you may be facing so that we can help put those on the table and we can help uh, solve those and keep, um, keep this relationship and this agreement fresh into the future. So at that point, uh, I would like to hand over to Anna from Austrade to cover trends in the UK for Australian tech exporters um, and things that they should be aware of when they are considering the UK as an export market. So Anna, over to you. 
Thanks very much, uh, Richard, and thank you very much for partnering with Austrade on the delivery of this uh, fantastic uh, uh, webinar. Um, so, look, Richard um, spoke a little bit about the importance um, of uh, trade investment flows between Australia and the UK, and that we are already very close trading partners. I think that creates a really strong and um, important baseline um, for businesses to do um, more together. And in my kind of part of the presentation, I will I'd just like to highlight why UK is an important market for Australian um, exporters. So um, UK is the third largest digital technology sector in the world. Um, and despite all of the various economic downturns that have been experienced globally, um, UK has been doing actually pretty well when it comes to um, growth in its technology um, sector. Um, we're not going to, um, you know, pretend that no, there hasn't been um, impact. Of course, there's been impact. There's been impact globally. Um, we do. We are experiencing the cost of living crisis. We've seen significant inflation. Um, but what we've seen in terms of the UK tech sector is that there's been it's still been consistent growth. Growth not as uh, significant as last year, but there is still a significant growth compared to previous years. And also, what's interesting is that we've seen that the levels of um, uh, investment into tech have reduced globally, um, but UK is still outperforming uh, as, as several countries around the world. Uh, it is still um, third for tech investment in the world, uh, but also it has uh, uh, has been impacted less than some of its other countries like the US and, and others. So we're still seeing those significant flows. And uh, UK, are also, UK has also been ranked quite highly in terms of its innovation, and we've seen significant um, adoption uh, and engagement in innovation and um, new technology here in the UK. So if we go to the next slide, please. Um, I wanted to highlight a couple of things that are happening in the UK that sort of really stand out. So earlier this um, year, uh, UK government released its um, uh, plans to make UK an international technology superpower, um, and it, it released its international um, technology strategy to do that. So that was really an important signal from the UK government that they will continue to invest and support um, innovation and adoption of technology across um, the UK, and they will continue to invest in creating an environment that facilitates that technology innovation. So whether it's through regulation or policy or other mechanisms. Um, so I think that makes it a quite an interesting um, place to consider. To further complement that, um, UK also released its quantum um, strategy, so similar to us in Australia. Uh, the strategy really sets out uh, the ambition and the commitment uh, of the UK government uh, to really scale uh, how quantum can transform uh, products, services, um, and really be embedded uh, in a day-to-day -day lives um, of uh, Brits. Uh, so that's quite interesting. And there's some investment and funding that's um, connected to that uh, strategy as well. And that creates opportunities for more collaboration, research and innovation between Australia and the UK on quantum and a really attractive landscape for Australian quantum companies to land and explore what's possible here in the UK. Um, I think more broadly, it's important to highlight um, that the UK has always been quite forward thinking when it comes to regulation. Um, we've seen several um, sandboxes roll, rolled out across the UK, which allow businesses to come and test their products in a real life environment with real life uh, data um, here in the UK and really start engaging uh, with consumers while they're still going through various regulatory approvals. Um, so earlier this year, uh, um, UK uh, implemented the digital sandbox uh, permanently, where before it will, you had to go through various rounds. Um, that sandbox is now available for uh, companies to use permanently. And there's also um, an AI sandbox that, are current, that, that they're currently working on to enable more um, uh, AI application businesses to, to test their products and solutions. Um, so it's always been on the front foot when it comes to regulation, looking at how it can address barriers um, and facilitate 
towards add further innovation, and this clearly continues to be um, focused on on that. I mentioned investments, so I'm not going to talk more about that, but there are significant um, flows of um, VC funds in the UK that you can tap into. Um, but more importantly, um, there's also a lot of government uh, backing and support. Uh, some of you who've been um, operating in the UK for a while, who've been talking to us, might have heard us talk about um, UK government's levelling up agenda. Um, that's quite interesting because what UK government wants to do, it wants to create uh, a an ecosystem more broadly across the UK, and not just focused on London. Yes, London is an exciting hub, but it's not all just about London. So UK government's been investing a lot into pro growing those centres and ecosystems across the uh, UK, and that creates opportunities for businesses to tap into support and funding that's available across different regions, uh, which could be quite helpful for those who are looking to grow and set up their businesses in the UK. Um, the other, the, the next two things that I'd like to mention is, of course, the a huge focus and, and access to research in a, in innovation in the UK. It's home to some of the um, largest um, forward um, thinking universities. Uh, it has uh, over 500 nationally and internationally significant research and innovation infrastructures. So if you are really in that sort of um, you know, new innovative cutting technology field, uh, there's an opportunity for you to come here, work with those um, uh, research institutions to further innovate and grow your products. Um, and finally, um, UK has been doing a lot to grow its talent. Uh, we all talk always about competition for talent. Um, UK has been, um, government's been, and various um, regional um, institutions have been working a lot with universities to see how they can grow the next pipeline of technology talent uh, for you to tap into. So all of that makes UK quite an interesting uh, market for Australian companies to consider. So if we go to the next slide, um, which is my last slide, probably a couple of things to point out in terms of some of the trends and where we think opportunities lie. So first of all, impact tech. So anything that has strong social responsibility or sustainability or environmental um, focus, um, there's a huge opportunity here. UK has very clear targets around net zero transition. Um, it focuses a lot on the ESG credentials. Um, uh, it works across industries and businesses uh, to implement some robust reporting and measurement of the social contribution of environmental contribution and ensure that everyone has strong sustainability credentials. It's an absolutely a must um, requirement here, which creates a lot of opportunities for businesses who are applying in that space. Um, health and wellness, of course, coming out of COVID, um, that that's really been a big focus for all countries. And we've since uh, UK invest a lot into the innovation around um, digital health, medtech, biotech. Um, it's also got those industries quite, those industries are quite strong here because of the strong um, university focus. And I think there's a strong appetite to innovate in that space because we're seeing a lot of pressure on the NHS system. So that creates opportunities um, for businesses in that area. Um, fintech's always been a big focus for the UK. It's one of the um, financial hubs of the world, so there's no surprise there. Um, cybersecurity, I think, you know, UK is not alone in that, um, but uh, it's important, it's becoming more and more important that as we are implementing more digital tools and solutions, uh, we are focused on, on cybersecurity and how that interacts um, and integrates into various um, services. Um, space technology, so look, so um, there's a strong link into looking at how we actually um, uh, monitor and scale our communication, how we uh, monitor what's happening in our environment. Um, space technology obviously plays a key role within that. So what, what's interesting on space is that it's not just about your typical kind of defence industries. It's really about that civil application of space and how it can um, further impact um, uh, and improve our day to day lives. And finally, um, deep tech, so quantum, blockchain, AI, robotics, um, integration of that in to various services and products um, and really looking to those future and forward technologies is something that we've seen a lot in the UK in terms of appetite to adopt those and look at them. So there's some of the key trends. Um, the free trade agreement creates a great opportunity for us to look at how we can help more businesses scale into the UK market and we'll talk more about that in a minute. And at this point, I'll hand over to Kirsty. 
Thanks very much, Anna. Um, and I'm here to give you a bit more of an overview on the Australian market for those UK companies that are looking to move to our country. Um, so just to give you a bit of a primer, if we can go to the next slide, please. So our population is a little bit smaller um, than the UK, so around 26 million people. But Luckily for us, and I think a good sign that we've already got strong relationships between Australia and the UK, around about 1.2 million Brits um, actually call Australia home already. So you will be in good company if you choose to, to move out into the Australian market. Now, we're tied to the UK, obviously, by culture, by common language, but also by business and legal practices as well. So that really makes Australia a pretty desirable market for international expansion. Australia has the 12th largest economy in the world. We're ranked eighth as a top direct investment direction and our cities like Sydney and Melbourne actually rank in the global top 10 cities for that. We're ranked 10 in the top 10 for advanced digital infrastructure and fourth in the world for the most attractive digital market. So what that tells you is Australia actually is a very, very good adopter and an early adopter of technology. So not only do you have a good consumer base for your tech, but also you've got a proving ground and a testing ground um, for your proof of concepts. Now, pulling together all of the technology subsectors, tech is actually Australia's third largest industry. It's valued about 167 billion Australian dollars, and that's about 8.5% of Australia's GDP. Um, now, it's actually expanded pretty quickly. It's been expanded by about 80% in the last five years, and that's really set to grow even more rapidly. We're predicted to reach about 250 billion Australian dollars um, by 2030. Now, Australia does have a demonstrated ability to um, grow global tech companies already. So you've got household games like Canva, Afterpay, Coltramp, Airwalks and Atlassian. and they've all made a splash on the global stage. And what's exciting is we now actually have 21 tech unicorns in Australia, and that compromises about 2.3% of unicorns globally. Now, I know that sounds like a bit of a small number, but actually in comparison, it's well above our 1.6% share of global GDP. So I think we're, we're doing okay in Australia for tech growth. Next slide, please. Now, Australia does have a plan to be a leading digital economy and society by 2030. So we'll see that sort of tech ecosystem growing more and more as we're looking to meet that pledge. Um, so in particular, you know, Australia has good government support for tech. So that's from grants to tax offsets, and that includes things like R&D tax incentives. We've also got policies and strategies in place at both, at both a national and state and territory level that's really there to support tech and innovation. Um, that's everything across critical technology and innovation, skills training in tech, cybersecurity and more. We've also got a pretty thriving innovation ecosystem. We've got more than 100 innovation hubs and clusters across the country, and they're developed between government, between industry and between academia. And they're across areas like medicine, advanced manufacturing, agriculture and deep tech. We've also got a growing investment ecosystem. So Australia attracted 7.4 billion um, Aussie dollars in tech investment funding in 2022. And we're seeing government and private investment in areas like deep tech sort of continuing on. You know, this week alone, one of the main Aussie VCs, Main Sequence Ventures, has raised 450 million Australian dollars to invest further in its deep tech fund. So we're seeing more and more of that continuing. Like the UK, Australia is growing its tech skills market. So we're currently ranked six in the world for the digital skills that are required to support tech innovation. Um, and the tech industry employs about 870,000 people, but there's more and more pledges um, to grow that. So increased training, supportive in, in education means that we're hoping to grow that labor pool to about 1.2 million by 2030. Now, if all of that wasn't enough, um, Australia's time zone um, and our close regional ties to Asia also really makes it a great place to have your APAC headquarters and use Australia as a springboard, not only into APAC, but also um, into New Zealand and Oceania as well. Next slide, please. So just like in the UK, there are a number of key trends that are happening in Australia at the moment that will provide opportunities for incoming UK companies. So first and foremost, you know, Australian businesses are really big IT spenders. They're going through a phase at the moment where they're upgrading to modern infrastructure. They're encompassing sort of SaaS solutions, data capability and other digital transformation capabilities in their day-to-day -day work. In fact, IT spending in 2022 reached $117 billion. So there's a good solid market for us there. 
Australia is also set to have 5G coverage across 95% of the population by 2025. Um, so we're also a growing testbed for 5G innovation, and that's in areas like mining, healthcare, transport, and utilities. Now, you may have seen in the news over the past 12 months that we've been sort of subject to a number of cyber attacks. And whilst bad for us, it also means that, you know, about 60% of Australian companies are looking to increase their cyber spend this year. Um, and that's across all major industries. So government, health, education, financial services, retail. Um, so demand is, is quite heavy and, you know, it exists in areas like managed security services, cloud and data security, and then sort of your offensive and defensive um, cyber opportunities. We've also seen a rapid increase in the demand and acceptance of digital health technologies. So there's sort of opportunities there around, you know, remote monitoring, data analytics, mobile health and applications. And then, as Anna mentioned, um, for the UK, our sort of interests in deep tech uh, are very well matched. So we're also looking at increasing areas around um, quantum and AI. So the quantum tech industry in Australia is set to be valued about six billion Australian dollars um, by 2045, and they're looking to employ about 19,000 people. Um, so that sort of growth is really being backed by research centres of excellence across the country. We've got strong government support with a national quantum strategy and funding sources at um, both national and state levels. And we're also seeing a similar amount of interest in AI and particularly around applications across manufacturing, agriculture and um, healthcare. Climate commitments are also opening up opportunities for clean tech um, and particularly those that enable corporate net zero journey. So everything from emissions reporting and tracking, sort of technology that enables green mobility, process efficiency, all the way to agriculture benefits across things like satellites and robotics, etc. There's also a growing market for digital games in Australia, um, both federal and state level support and tax event incentives are here for you to take advantage of, particularly if you're looking at setting up a studio in Australia. And finally, though we covered this in our webinar last week, FinTech um, is a growing market here. We're ranked sixth in the world. We've got a $4 billion industry with about roughly 800 companies in the FinTech space. But there's also broader opportunities across financial services. So, you know, areas like payment tech, wealth tech, reg tech, and then your sort of broader ESG and sustainability um, platforms. So in general, you know, the UK government, we've been working really hard to bring these opportunities um, to these areas to UK businesses. So last year we ran a net zero innovation, innovation mission, for example, that was aimed to support climate tech companies and connecting them into ANZ corporates. Um, but this year we're also bringing out additional trade missions. So in August, we're hosting a FinTech trade mission and in November, a digital and data trade mission. So if you're interested in learning more about the work that we do and the work that Austray does, please um, you know, drop a line in the chat and we can reach out separately. Go to the next slide, please. Um, so that's kind of our formalities done and our market overviews done. So thanks very much to Richard and Anna for joining me in those overviews. And really we're here to set the scene as to why the FTA is so important and how it helps Australian and UK businesses. Now we're gonna kick off with a panel discussion on the benefits of the FTA. So I'd like to welcome back Anna and Richard on camera, along with Kate Montgomery, who's the Director of Market for Telstra EMEA, and George Riddell, who's the Director of Trade Strategy at EY. I think we'll kick off with a nice little question for Richard. So we've kind of heard a little bit about the overview and the purpose of the FTA. But in practical terms, how do you think the FTA can help facilitate more um, export opportunities in both directions? Thank you, Kirsty. So um, I think in this business, in, in tech, um, it really does two things. It locks us together in that regulatory kind of cooperation space uh, through those dialogues. And then it also, uh, helps the mobility um, of our people um, and the recognition of qualifications across our people as well. So it's some of that ability to get people backwards and forwards, people working together, people um, collaborating together uh, in this space. Fantastic. And I guess a follow up question for both you, Richard, and for George. I mean, from an ongoing trade policy perspective, you know, we've mentioned that we're in that first 100 days of implementation. There's going to be ongoing dialogues that happen throughout the free trade agreement. But how do you think the ongoing Oz UK relationship behind the FTA is going to look, particularly for government, but also for industry and businesses? And George, I might get you to start if that's all right. 
Thanks, Kirsty, and, and it's great to be here this morning slash evening for, for colleagues down in Australia. I think, you know, when businesses and in particular technology businesses are looking to expand internationally and, and scale beyond sort of their domestic home market, you know, th there's a lot of different factors that they'll be looking at. Um, one of them is how easy is it to start trading with that other country? And, you know, when you look at the FTA and what it does around ease of establishment, mobility of talent and data flows, those are really important factors for businesses when, you know, being able to, to trade between the UK and Australia. More, you know, looking more broadly, obviously we're in quite a complicated geopolitical situation around the world. Tech, the tech sector has been at the forefront of bearing the brunt of those geopolitical tensions. And I think in particular, you know, looking beyond the FTA to the AUKUS initiatives and sort of the other bilateral cooperation that, that the UK and Australia has, that's an incredibly important thing, you know, around sort of ensuring that any investment and, you know, trade that's happening is not going to be disrupted and, you know, will be able to continue in, in a strong way. Great. Thanks, George. And Richard, anything you want to add there? Well, just to say that uh, you do business with people you trust and people you can work with and you look to do it in places where you have certainty. And I think the UK Australia relationship has that in bucket loads and the FTA gives even more certainty uh, for that alignment in the future. Great, thank you. I mean, um, question next, I guess, for Anna. So we've sort of talked a little bit about data flows and, and George just mentioned it as well. So I guess from your perspective, how is the enhanced digital trade and free movement of data provisions going to impact business operations? Yeah, no, absolutely. Look, I think um, all of the tech businesses are playing in the area of using data. So it's it's such an important component um, to what they do. The free trade agreement um, enables free flow of data between our two jurisdictions. So it removes any restrictive practices or requirements that might be currently in place to host data um, uh, in a new jurisdiction or to um, get uh, additional approvals um, to be able to move data across, um, I guess, let's say borders. So those will be eliminated. So businesses operating in a tech space can feel confident uh, that they can collect process transfer data between the two two countries uh, without facing any unnecessary um, red tape and any unnecessary costs uh, that I know that sometimes they currently have to um, go through various application approval process that also attract um, costs. So, so that will make it a lot more easier and streamlined. Um, I think uh, also important to point out on the whole digital piece um, that uh, there's also uh, will be um, uh, uh, the, the, the electronic contract signatures um, will be widely recognized across other two jurisdictions, which will also make it a lot easier for those data driven digital businesses to operate across the two um, jurisdictions as well. And um, something that I like to point out, um, uh, so apologies if those on the call already heard it because I do say it all the time, is that I'm quite interested in what does that mean in terms of new products and solutions as well. So what can businesses do to innovate now that we have this pro free flow of data between the two borders. Now there, there is more opportunity and recognition of electronic contracts, signatures, etc. What new solutions and offerings can um, technology business come up with to really leverage that opportunity and also make it easier for consumers to engage across both jurisdictions and across borders as well? Absolutely, Anna. I mean, I think that's a great question. Probably something I'm going to start asking as well. So I may, I may steal that one from you when I talk to other businesses. But I mean, I think that's a pretty good segue. And and Kate, dropping to you. I mean, are you expecting to use these types of provisions at Telstra, and what do they mean um, for you from a broader business sense? Okay. So good morning. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, yeah. So. Um, Telstra is very positive about the FTA. Just to echo the comments, it, you know, it sets a stable and positive uh, context for for business expansion between our two nations. And I would also echo George's point about the importance of the AUKUS Pact, and that businesses can uh, expand internationally, knowing that we have that government endorsement, and that there's a long-term stable and uh, context that gives us that that confidence. But more specifically, I think around the data regulations, it removes 
uh, perhaps the hindrance of um, mandatory in-country data hosting, and that allows a B2B uh, IT services company like, like Telstra International to help clients uh, develop a data strategy, a cloud hosting strategy that uh, drives digital efficiency and is not uh, mandated by regulation. So data can be hosted according to customer requirement or vertical market uh, needs, um, uh, for example, at the edge and not necessarily uh, uh, in country as, as a matter of course. And then uh, a further point that I think is uh, really positive around the FTA, um, as I say, um, anyone from Australia that's joined uh, the webinar will know uh, Telstra uh, in our home market as a, you know, a telco provider. Outside of Australia, um, Telstra International is a B2B services provider. And so we find that many of our clients use uh, London as a springboard also into Europe. Um, so I think that, you know, this pivotal relationship between the UK and the Australia is actually going to be a catalyst for unlocking pan-regional expansion as we use uh, Australia. Um, we see our clients using Australia as a springboard into Asia and vice versa for London uh, into Europe. So on the whole, um, yeah, really positive about um, the, the opportunities that the FTA unlocks. Thanks very much, Kate. Um, and Anna, you and I have sort of gone through what the trends are looking like in Australia and the UK. I guess some of the unifying uh, themes that we see when we talk to companies is that they're also interested in working into the public sector. So I guess what new opportunities will become available for Australian and UK businesses because of the FTA's procurement provisions? Um, so, yes, a uh, very good point, uh, Kirsty. So procurement um, provisions will um, will enable both com companies to bid on um, contracts in both jurisdictions um, and be treated uh, the same as the local uh, uh, providers when bidding for those contracts. That includes government contracts. And that, that's a huge opportunity, right? In the past, where there might have been restrictions uh, for UK companies to bid on government contracts in Australia or Australian companies companies on government contracts in the UK, those restrictions are now being eliminated, which opens up such a big, um, uh, I guess, part of the market um, uh, for, for those companies uh, to compete for. So I think that that's, that's very important and critical um, and will create really significant opportunities in both directions. Thank you. Um, now, Richard, uh, we'll throw back to you. So people mobility provisions have also been promoted as sort of one of the major wins of the FTA. Can you take us through some of, I guess, the key changes um, and how you see businesses benefiting from them going forward? Yeah, sure, Kirsty. Um, but maybe just before I do that, to to come in on what Anna was saying there. So those government procurement contracts and the accessibility to those on kind of equal terms, uh, you know, terms the same as um, yeah, if it's a British business coming to Australia, it's the same the same terms that, that an Australian business would would bid on. Um, I think you've still got to remember you've got to be smart and you've got to understand your market when you do that. <laughs> so there may be on on both sides. Um, so I know because it was something I was looking at this afternoon, but um, for some um, Australian contracts, for example, there is a local content provision. And so whether you are an Australian business or whether you are a UK business, you will have to meet those same provisions that the contracting authority is, is specifying. So remember, you still need to be on your game, smart and, um, and know your market. Um, so go, going back to your original question, um, talking about some of the mobility provisions. So um, the I, I think the first thing that we have is that um, uh, that working holiday um, youth mobility scheme that I mentioned before. So uh, on both sides, um, people will be able to um, increase uh, for up to up to three years. Um, when Brits come to Australia, they no longer have to have um, specified requirements. They're eligible to um, to work uh, across. Um, any industry, and um, for Brits coming to Australia, they've already um, come into force from the from the first of July, and um, going the other way, uh, that will be available from the first of July uh, next year. Um, 
And uh, we also have that intracantropony transfer uh, element that we spoke about where there is no longer um, the need to uh, have uh, jobs um, against that skilled migration list that it's open um, up to uh, people across uh, all industries, which I think is something very special uh, um, because um, that has only been available between Australia and New Zealand before. And for the UK to join that, I think is uh, a really big step forwards. Right. And I mean, from the business perspective, we might start with you, you, George. I mean, are you planning or your clients planning to take up these provisions within EY? Thanks. So certainly on the mobility front, yes, that is something that we look to actively leverage um, when, you know, sort of making those decisions around staffing and resourcing. The one thing I would say is, you know, we also look at it for what sorts of benefits it can bring and particularly when you, we're talking about you know the exchange of knowledge and skills among our workforce making sure that there is that collaboration that we are able to go over virtual is great don't get me wrong you know through the pandemic and and everything else but that business mobility is really drive new innovation and thinking and development of ideas is something that's incredibly important to us so leveraging these provisions is something that we are already starting to do, but we'll look to expand on in the future. Thanks, George. And Kay, what about you at Telstra? Yeah, I mean, um, that mobility of talent is absolutely crucial, particularly in the current skill shortage, particularly in tech and, and, and cyber. Um, the FTA provides specifically a more flex, more flexibility for in Sorry, Kate, I think we've just lost your audio very briefly. You're just on mute. Sorry. My there we go. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, particularly uh, um, intercompany uh, transfer, I think, is, is super uh, important. We know, don't we, in the battle for talent that candidates and employees are looking for more than just that, that pay slip at the end of the month. They're looking for for self-determination, they're looking for opportunity to, to expand their, their careers and having exposure to different worldviews and alternative uh, ways of doing business is absolutely crucial. It enriches both the individual, the organisation and the uh, economy overall, I think. And um, I would call out as well, you know, we talked about space, we, talked, uh, we mentioned the UK-Australia space bridge and where you have you know, really global markets with specialist skills, being able to access a greater pool of talent uh, to drive that innovation uh, is absolutely crucial. So, um, yeah, uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, the expansion of, of mobility of talent, particularly, I think, for those uh, mid-career candidates who are uh, in their, you know, up to 35, makes a big difference in bringing, uh, bringing in those really uh, hard to find uh, specialist skills. Thanks. Um, Kirsty, if you don't mind, I might jump in to give a bit of a plug to the um, innovation and early careers um, pilot um, that's launching on the 25th of September. Um, so at this stage, it's a pilot. So it's really in, in one direction for now. So attracting uh, UK talent to Australia. But we're hoping that if the, if the pilot goes well, um, we, it will also open up opportunities in the other direction as well. And I think uh, that's a really interesting pathway both for the UK businesses who are um, who have a branch in Australia to bring um, UK talent over um, to work uh, in their business in Australia but also for Australian businesses um, looking to bring UK talent to help them innovate and bring some of the skills and expertise that UK might have that we currently might not have or competing for um, in Australia so there's two stream one is for um, for early careers so for graduates um, with um, with skills and experience in, in different fields. And the other one is for innovators. Um, for graduates, it's for placements for up to a year in Australia. And then for innovators, it could be up to three years. Um, so that's a very exciting pilot. Um, pe people can find more information about that on the DFAT website and um, applications open on 25th of September. Very exciting. Mark the calendars. Thank you, Anna. Um, and I mean, while you have the mic, you know, we've we've heard from Richard at the beginning of the session that 
one of the exciting parts of the FTA is that we do have a, it's the first trade agreement to include a comprehensive innovation chapter. And I guess from your perspective, how do you see the innovation chapter impacting and sort of providing increased market access and opportunities for technology businesses? Yes, I think it's very, very exciting. Something that Richard uh, also pointed out uh, in earlier on is that this agreement is exciting because it's not just about goods, it's about services. And I think innovation chapters that are the aspect of the agreement that really takes it to be a, a more modern, comprehensive agreement than some of the other uh, free trade agreements that have been negotiated in the past. Um, so the innovation chapter um, has a commitment that there will be an innovation dialogue established uh, between Australia and the UK in the next 12 months. Um, and really the focus of that uh, innovation dialogue, I think, would be three prong. Um, so first of all, it will look at um, regulation. So creating um, aligned regulation um, between Australia and the UK that helps facilitate um, some of that those innovation innovative technologies so it's regulation around ai and some of the new tech that's coming up so uh, that's quite exciting for companies because one um, the dialogue would look at how they can create appropriate regulation that's not restrictive but two there will also be alignment between what's um, happening and how things are regulated in australia and the uk which will obviously make it a lot easier for businesses to uh, implement their product in both jurisdictions. Um, the other area of the dialogue will be to look at any existing restrictive policies and practices. Um, so that will provide companies an opportunity to feed um, feedback into that dialogue, whether it's through Austrade or uh, DBT or others, in terms of what is currently actually restricted, restricting some of that innovation and how that can be addressed across both um, jurisdiction. And, and third, um, it will create. Uh, it will encourage uh, both countries to identify uh, areas uh, where we would like to work more together to innovate, um, run, um, kind of code develop co-designed R&D projects across any particular uh, areas, whether it's health or whether it's, um, I don't know, space, um, uh, where we want to do something together to, to test, innovate and develop new products and solution together across both jurisdictions, uh, which obviously then will create a platform for businesses to tap into that, that and, and play an exciting role within that. Thanks, Anna. And Kate, I mean, Telstra has a great innovation culture itself. I guess from the business perspective, how do you think the um, innovation chapter is going to impact industry? Well, broadly, it um, allows the opening up of a much bigger pool of investor funding to UK and Australia uh, scale ups. Um, Telstra Ventures, uh, specifically inv investing in um, uh, the Australian uh, scale ups across their areas of AI, cyber, and, and green tech. And I think, you know, sometimes there'll be areas of alignment. So with Telstra Health, we see there's a great number of synergies between our, our health uh, systems, but in other areas, perhaps we can learn from each other and bring innovation into our respective countries. And arguably for a number of reasons, uh, Australia is perhaps a market leader in, in green tech and sustainability, um, uh, innovation and I think there's some great uh, examples and some great learning that you can um, Australia can bring innovation into the UK and and vice versa. Thanks, Kate. And you know, George, from from a trade perspective and our ongoing relationship, I mean, how do you see um, the innovation impacting how we work together and and how business works together? Thanks. So I I mean, it's been said a number of times here that you know the FTA creates a platform for for future cooperation, and I think the real value of this is going to be you know really you know not everything is always going to get right first time round, and you know it, it this is complicated areas regulations are developing incredibly rapidly, so the most important thing is that business is feeding into that discussion that you know, they're not sitting on the sidelines, but because there are now these regular points of contact, particularly on the innovation front, but also on the regulatory cooperation, um, mobility, whatever the case may be, the businesses need to be feeding in in order to be you know, making sure that the agenda is suiting what's right for them and, and boosting that bilateral trade and investment that the companies are ultimately undertaking. So. Yeah, it's a start, but we need to be using it in order to make it the most effective um, that it can be and really leverage that opportunity. Absolutely. And Anna, Richard, anything else you want to add on that? 
Uh, no, I was just noticing a, a, a question in the chat there from Brian about uh, research and innovation grants as well. Though, and I was going to say that sadly not, Brian, it's not default access yet to grants in both countries, uh, but you, there are many uh, joint research grants um, that are available to the UK and Australia. Um, and we can send you a little bit more information about those. They're available uh, in the UK through the UKRI, but sadly it's not a default uh, position of access to national grants um, at this point in time. Thanks, Richard. Um, and we are coming up to sort of the end of um, our questions for the panel. So please don't be shy, put any questions that you have in the chat bar or the Q&A so that we can ask them with our last few minutes. But I guess uh, a sort of one final question from me, and it's for both Kate and George, I guess, why have you or the businesses that you work with selected UK um, or Australia for international expansion? And what's, I guess, the experience been so far? And some of our, crazy, our favorite questions are always, you know, what's worked well um, and what have some of the challenges been? So if you can give us some examples, that would be fantastic. And we might start with ladies first, please, Kate. Well, I don't know if uh, Telstra selected, uh, you know, as a long-standing technology company that that the kind of decision was already made. I would say that uh, in Telstra International, for, so for the divisions overseas outside of Australia, what we see is uh, a great... Um, uh, so we've talked about the cultural synergies, but also I think um, the whole Asia Pacific region in terms of manufacturing and innovation and that energy to do business. I think that uh, um, uh, international expansion into that region is just an, uh, enormously positive. And I think that the, uh, the FTA can only uh, drive drive better opportunities for us all. So I think, yeah, on uh, I think. Um, and we've talked, touched on also sort of the global, the geopolitical uh, arena and the emergence of, of, of Australia um, as, a, as a world power on, on that stage. So I think all the, all the headwinds are, are driving towards uh, this greater cooperation, this greater opportunity um, that the FTA can only help to uh, unleash. Thanks, Kate. And, and George, what about you and the experience that you've had with your clients? Thanks. So, yeah, obviously EY is established, well established in, in both the UK and Australia, but working with clients around sort of their, the decision making factors uh, that they take into account at the moment, sort of in addition to the FTA, I would say, um, for Australian companies looking at the UK, it's, re you know, some supporting factors, definitely access to the capital markets. Um, in London is an incredibly important point around scaling um, and international expansion. There's also the supporting ecosystem that um, is here in the UK around the, you know, financial and related professional services, whether that's insurance, consulting, um, legal services, you do have quite, you, it's not quite a one-stop shop, but it is, you know, easy to get that in addition to quite a vibrant um, startup tech scene that we have here in the country. In terms of UK companies looking at Australia, I know we've, we've touched on um, a, a couple over the course of this conversation. I would really highlight the um, role of environmental technologies um, and sort of the, the amount of work that's happening in that space at the moment, particularly as it relates to some of the critical minerals discussions and investment strategy that Australia's um, launched over the last six months that's driving a huge amount of interest from UK companies um, wanting to expand further in this space. Thanks very much, George. Um, and I've seen a question has come in from the chat from David. Um, and the question is, if we were to expand to Australia as an APAC hub, what are the available capabilities, support skills to facilitate regional expansion from an Australia base? Anybody want to put their hands up to answer that question? If not, I can lend a DBT focus. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, I'm quite interested um, uh, in, in the DBT focus. I think from an Australian perspective, uh, once you, you have your Australian entity, um, we offer support to Australian companies as Australia to grow to other markets. Um, so we would be assisting you to grow into other markets across APAC. You would have access to the Australian um, free trade agreements that Australia has with most Asian countries, which 
make it a lot easier for you to do business uh, across Asia as an Australian entity. Um, so that that's an, a huge opportunity in itself. Everything we just talked about, the barriers that's been removed between Australia and the UK, we have similar agreements with most Asian countries. Um, so those barriers um, have been removed in, in, in that area. Um, and then the support that Australia would, would offer companies um, who are exploring international markets across Asia uh, would be around understanding the regulatory environment, understanding various requirements, understanding where the opportunities might lie, um, helping um, uh, businesses find uh, partners, customers across across um, uh, those Asian markets, navigate, um, I guess, cultural differences, etc. Um, so we've got teams in most of those Asian markets and we will be there to help you grow and, and support your growth, international growth. Thanks, Anna. And George, did you have something to add there? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'd probably say, that, you know, sort of experiences in Australia myself um, is there's, it's a well tr trodden path and there's a huge amount in addition to the Austrade and DBT support that, that you can get. There's also a huge amount of sort of local businesses and chambers of commerce who have an incredible in deep expertise and experience in this area, um, whether it's the ASEAN Australian Chamber of Commerce or with individual um, APAC countries that, you know, it is something that Australian businesses focus a lot on and there's a huge amount of that community and discussion happening um, across sort of the main business hubs in Australia. So very much something that when you're there, you can get involved in, in, in quite, you know, a, a comprehensive way. Thanks, George. And I mean, just echoing on the, the DBT front, very similar to, to what both George and Anna have had to say. And we also have uh, countries, uh, so post and country across the APAC region who can lend you that extra support in addition to how we would support you going from the UK into Australia. So it is that part around connections, understanding the local market and local culture. Um, and don't forget as well, there's a lot of organizations across the UK that are working to support things like trade missions into the APAC region. And quite a number of them will tag on multiple countries at once. So you can kind of get that sense as you're looking at Australia, you can also be exploring um, the other APAC regions at the same time. Now we've had another great question come in and probably the last one that we've got time for. Um, so if you did have other questions, pop them in the chat. We can always come back to you by email as well. Talking about from um, Joseph, the geopolitical complexities will increase the demand and defense and increase the prominence of the space sector. So do we see that happening? And if so, um, does South Australia play a role in that? Who wants to jump in on the space side of things? <laughs> well, I can see that uh, that uh, that Richard's already put in some information um, uh, yeah. there. Um, uh, but yeah, so so I'm a, I'll just be brief, um, and then happy to hand over to Richard. Uh, yes, there's already strong focus on it. To Richard's one of the Richard's points, we already have Australia UK Space Bridge Framework uh, in place. So we've been working on enhancing collaboration between Australia and UK on space for the last two years. Uh, but yes, absolutely, with a more focus on defence and security, um, uh, that we are seeing increased engagement in a space sector um, with the implementation of AUKUS, so the trilateral agreement between Australia, UK and the US. Um, there will be opportunities um, for more technology companies to tap into various supply chains around that. We're still working through what that, does that exactly look like, um, um, but uh, that will create uh, environment for more uh, tech businesses to operate across that triangle uh, and plug into those supply chains as well. Um, so I guess in short, yes, uh, but there's still a bit that we need to work through. But over to you, Richard. Yeah, no, I think Anna's covered it really well. One thing I'd just like to highlight. So last week in Sydney, we launched um, together with uh, the Australian uh, Nuclear Science and Technology uh, Organization, um, an agroclimate uh, sandpit event where we've got uh, 15 UK and 15 Australian experts uh, looking to collaborate um, in this space uh, using uh, space, space tech. Um, uh, around agriculture and climate. So there's lots of stuff going on. Um, please do get in touch. We can share a little bit more with you. Thanks very much. And thank you all. It's unfortunately all the time we've got for questions now. Um, so thanks so much to our panelists, Anna and Richard, Kate and George. 
And thanks very much everyone who's joined us on the call this evening slash this morning. Now to find out more about the FTA, you can search DFAT UK FTA for information on Australia or UK Government Australia FTA for information in the UK. Please reach out to us at Austrade if you're an Australian business looking to expand overseas and then to DBT if you're a British tech business looking to expand outside the UK. We did have that question come through in the chat and I've just popped my email address in there. So happy for you to reach out to me directly. Um, and that concludes our session. So thanks again, everyone, for joining us and we hope to hear from you all soon.